The Lord be with you. It is good to be uh, together this morning um, uh, to be able to welcome you all here, but I know a large um, contingent online who are joining us for this first uh, lecture in our Theologian in Residence um, weekend. It is good to be able to be together um, in person to be able to do this. Um, I especially want to uh, warmly welcome those who are joining us as guests this morning. Um, one of the gifts of spending this weekend together is that we can um, open our doors and welcome um, the wider community to come and engage in challenging and fruitful conversations with one another. Many of you know these theologian in residence lectures were created in honor of the Reverend Dr. David Watermulder and his wife Ruth, who served this congregation from 1962 to 1986. Established in 1988, these lectures are intended to both celebrate excellence in scholarship, but also call the church to more deeply engage with the world through a lens of scripture, theology, and ethics. Just some of the scholars who many of you have been here to hear included Walter Brueggemann, Peter Gomes, John Dominic Crossan, Diana Eck, Brian Blount, Miroslav Wolf, uh, Serene Jones, our last pre-pandemic theologian in residence, and then last year, Jonathan Walton. In his ministry, David Watermelder often named and confronted the issue of racism and inequality in our communities and in our nation, especially after attending himself the March on Washington in 1963, he was unflinching in his expectations that this congregation would engage thoughtfully and intentionally on issues of race and racism. And so I wanted to share a little portion of a sermon he gave from this pulpit in 1963. And I'm gonna read this for you. It uses language um, that is not the language necessarily, that is not the language that we use today, but I'm gonna read um, David's, a portion of that 
um, sermon for you. And this is how long I've been here now. I have to wear glasses to read this. So, <clears throat> we can begin to understand this crisis as we recognize a turning point in American history, which the March on Washington symbolizes. Things will never be the same again. Whatever we may think of the last 100 years since the Emancipation Proclamation, 1963 marked a new beginning. We dare not read the events of this past year simply as some more of the same kind of uprising familiar to the past decades. This movement is not headed by interested white people. It is directed by intelligent, thoughtful Negroes. It is not a movement of isolated resistance here or there. It is nationwide. It is not led by voices crying in the night for a hearing. It will reshape the political future of America. It is not confined to the United States. Racial strife in America is page one news around the world. He goes on in this sermon then later to instruct parishioners to go out and get themselves a copy of James Baldwin's new book, The Fire Next Time. I share this with you this morning because as we as a congregation have grown more intentional in our engagement in the personal, local, and national conversations around issues of racism and white supremacy, it's essential to remember that this is not a new topic for us as a church. So I can think of no better way to honor David and Ruth's legacy as leaders in this congregation, the national church, and in this community than to be able to welcome this year's theologian in residence, Lisa Sharon Harper. From Ferguson to New York, and from Germany to South Africa to Australia, Lisa Sharon Harper leads trainings that increase clergy and community leaders' capacity to organize people of faith toward a just world. A prolific speaker, writer, and activist, Lisa is the founder and president of Freedom Road, a consulting group dedicated to shrinking the narrative gap in our nation by designing forums and experiences that bring common understanding, common commitment, and common action. Ms. Harper is the author of several books, including Evangelical Does Not Equal Republican or Democrat, Left, Right, and Christ, Evangelical Faith in Politics, Forgive Us, Confessions of a Compromised Faith, and the critically acclaimed The Very Good Gospel, How Everything Wrong Can Be Made Right. A columnist at Sojourners Magazine and an Auburn Theological Seminary Senior Fellow, Lisa has appeared on TV One, Fox News Online, NPR, and Al Jazeera America. Her writing has been featured in CNN Belief Blog, The National Critic Review, Sojourners, The Huffington Post, Relevant Magazine, and Essence Magazine. She writes extensively on shalom and governance, immigration reform, healthcare reform, poverty, racial and gender justice, climate change, and transformational civic engagement. One more page. That's very impressive. <laughs> Lisa earned her master's degree in human rights from Columbia University in New York City and served as Sojourner's chief church engagement officer. In this capacity, she fasted for 22 days as a core faster in 2013 with the immigration reform Fast for Families. She trained and catalyzed evangelicals in St. Louis and Baltimore to engage the 2014 push for justice in Ferguson and the 2015 healing process in Baltimore. And she educated faith leaders in South Africa to pull the levers of their new democracy towards racial equity and economic inclusion. This morning, Lisa is gonna present for about an hour and then we'll have a time of questions and answers together. If any of you have yet to purchase her book, it is for sale outside, but I saw many of you clutching your books as you came in. And so she will also um, be out in the atrium um, available to chat and to sign books as well when we are done. So let us warmly welcome Lisa Sharon Harper. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for those who are watching online. Um, I'm going to dive right in. We're going to talk today about the intersections of race and gender in uh, the origins of our nation and, and, the, inter and the origins of, the, of those two constructs. They actually were created around the same time on this soil in terms of the law. So let's, let's without further ado, let's dive in because we really do have a lot of 
ground to cover. 360 BC, we have to go back that far, <laughs> okay? So 360 BC, Plato writes his uh, The Republic. It's a tome, multiple books, right? So in one of those books, he lays out this concept that he calls race. And while I don't think he actually thought this was true physically, it is something that he talked about. And so we can, we can see something about this construct called race in its original construction. He said race is the different metals the different people groups are made of. And that some of those people groups are gold, some are made of silver, others are made of copper and iron. And whatever metal the people group is made of determines how they will serve society. So the gold people will serve society in this way, the copper people in that way, and so on and so forth. And I'm going to have to take off my earring, I think. So I hate when it happens. <laughs> okay, here we go. So the copper people in that way and so forth and so forth, and, and so you get the point. So what you have is you have a situation where race as a construct, um, it, what it does is it serves to order society. And it's debatable about whether or not, here we go, about whether or not um, it was hierarchical at the time. But it didn't take long for it to become clear. So 10 years later, there was a book that was written, um, actually out of a series of lectures by Aristotle, Plato's student. Aristotle wrote in his On Politics, he wrote that if a people group has been conquered, it has shown that it was created to be enslaved. And scholars believe, many scholars believe, that when Aristotle imagined a full human being, as was the case with all of his contemporaries, he would have understood someone who was male, someone who was Western, or white like him, and someone who was able-bodied. So that's what it took to be a full human being. Okay, so it wasn't the earrings or anything. So let's see what this was. Is it okay? Okay. So flash forward about a thousand years. Okay, so that's that's foundations. About a thousand years later, you get the Pope, Pope Nicholas V. Pope Nicholas V issues the papal bull that is called Romanus Pontifex in 1453. 1452, 53, depending on where you, where you land. In 1452, a family friend who was an explorer comes to him and says, hey, Pope, uh, I want to go exploring and I need a blessing. And the Pope says, hey, I'll give you a blessing. In fact, I'll do you one better. If you come across land that is not Christianized, they're not Christian or they're not civilized, then you have the power to claim that land for the throne and enslave its people. It's that edict that gave us the world as we know it today. That edict laid the legal foundations for the age of conquest. It laid the legal foundations for the colonization of every nation in Africa, North America, South America, and Central America, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, the world as we know it was shaped by that edict and others like it that came afterwards. So now we want to jump to America's establishment, Jamestown, the, the colony of Jamestown. It was established in 1608. It's the very first colony in American history. And about 22 years after Jamestown is, is established, a young girl named Elizabeth Key is born. She's born in 1630 in Warwick, Virginia, which is just downriver from Jamestown. Um, her father, around this time, um, was uh, a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses. In other words, her father raped her mother. Her mother had her because her mother was enslaved. And he was now a member of the House of Burgesses. And she took her case to court because she started thinking a few years later um, circa 1650, she started, she realized, you know what, according to English common law, you cannot enslave another English citizen, nor can you enslave another Christian. And so she said, wait a minute, my dad 
had me baptized, and my dad is an English citizen, and citizenship comes through the line of the father. Therefore, I am a citizen, and I should not be able to be enslaved. So she took her case to court and won. And when she won, that was groundbreaking. There had, always, there had already been some judicial rule, um, rulings that began to racialize indentured, um, uh, the, really racialize the difference between indentured servitude and slavery and make enslavement a black thing. But before, until this, this was the legislative moment when, uh, when she, she won her freedom and then 12 years later, in 1662, the House of Burgesses, who were the white male planter class, they said, you know what, we have a lot of our, our free labor now leaving because they too are the sons or daughters of English citizens, and we've baptized them. So we need to change this. So these law-abiding lawmakers, you would think that maybe, maybe they would, they would abide by English law. But no, what they did was they changed the law to benefit them. So what they did is they said, no longer are we going to abide by English common law to determine where citizenship is, is born, is created in America or, or recognized. Now we're going to abide by the Roman law of Partis. The Roman law of Partis takes the line of the mother in order to determine if you are a citizen. In other words, if your mother is a citizen, then you are a citizen. Now, who does that benefit? When the common practice is the rape of enslaved Africans. And that's what's causing this burgeoning of mixed race children to rise up in, in Virginia and claim their freedom according to the law. So they just changed the law and they said, okay, now we're going by the law of partis and now unto the thousandth generation and beyond, if your mother traces back to an enslaved person, then that means you are not a citizen, and because you are not a citizen, you therefore can be enslaved. And then they added two words that created race-based slavery in America, in perpetuity. In other words, forever. So here, in the very first race law on this land, you have the confluence, the intersection of race, gender, and citizenship all in the same one law. And it's the first citizenship law that was created on this land. It's the first gender-based law that was created on this land. And it was the first race law that was created on this land. So when we talk about those three things, and we're really just focusing on race and gender today, but when you talk about those three things, you cannot extricate one from the other in terms of the hierarchies of human belonging that were created in the foundations of our nation. So now let's flash forward two years to the colony of Maryland. In Maryland, you have a different situation. But, you know, laws are always created um, because there's somebody senses a problem rising on the ground, and the law is created to solve for that problem. It's never created in a bubble. It's not philosophy. People don't create laws just because, oh, this is a this would be a good law to have. No, it's because somebody sees there's a problem on the ground. So the perceived problem on the ground in Virginia, right, was the mixed-race children that were confusing the racial caste system that was beginning to develop there. And the question of citizenship. The problem that was rising in Maryland that they perceived two years later was this. It was white women coming from, they were Ulster Scott, or they were Irish, indentured servants, working right alongside enslaved African men. And they were marrying these men and having children with them and creating, again, muddying the caste system, the racial caste system. Because 
what would these children be? Would they be able to become free? Would they be endangered or would they be enslaved? It also bruised the egos of those white planter class legislators. Let's be real, come on. They were marrying, they would rather marry enslaved Africans than to marry their own, their own men. So what did they do? They passed a law. And in this law, they declared that if a white woman marries an enslaved black man, then she herself would be enslaved by her husband's master until her husband's death. Oh, and her children would be enslaved in perpetuity. Again, gender and race in the second race law ever. Boom. They are intersected. You cannot weave one from the other. Now, in 1681, or actually between, let's go, let's go a little bit between that. Um, in six, well, no, let's jump there. 1681, Eleanor, um, Eleanor Butler, um, a.k.a. Irish Nell, is brought by Lord Baltimore to the shores of the, if, um, the eastern shores of Maryland. And she herself is an indentured servant. She's an Irish indentured servant. And he, you know, takes her and has her housed at the plantation of a friend down on that eastern shore. And while she's there, she falls in love with a man named Charles Butler. And they decide they want to get married. And he's enslaved. He's an enslaved African man. So they've already passed this law in 1664. People warn her, don't do it because you're going to be enslaved. If you marry him, you're going to be enslaved. She's like 16 years old. So she's like, oh, it's not that big a deal. Don't worry about it, right? So, and remember, her children will be enslaved in perpetuity according to this law. So she goes to Lord Baltimore and begs for him to change the law so that she can get married to the man that she loves. Now, mind you, Lord Baltimore really liked her and actually was hoping that he could marry her. But out of love, he, he decided that he was going to help change the law in order for the, this girl that, remember, she's 16, that he was planning to marry, that she could marry Charles Butler instead. The law has changed, but too late, too late for Eleanor, for Irish Nell. She got married before the law was changed, and as a result, she was enslaved. She was enslaved for the rest of her life, and her children were enslaved all the way through until the Revolutionary War. Children and children's children and children's children's children. So many white women were enslaved. There were 600 mixed-race children in the colonies of Maryland and Delaware alone in the colonial era. And they all traced back to white women. So in this context, two ships sail to America. The first ship is, the, is a ship coming from Belfast, from the Northern Ireland um, area, Atrium or Antrium. Um, and Maudlin McGee was on that boat. With her husband, George McGee, they landed on the eastern shore of Maryland in 1682. They were escaping retribution, um, the retribution of indigenous Irish people who were rising up against the Scots Scots um, who had been helping the English to settle um, the northern Irish lands and plant plantations on them. The Scots at that time were being used by the English, literally conscripted, come, you guys are now going to be the overseers of the land that we own in northern Ireland. So in uh, 1683, the year after Maudlin and George sailed. There was a major uprising. 12,000 people were killed in one day in the area that they left from. So I don't know how George and Maudlin came, to, came the year before. My guess is that tensions were rising and that they were coming to help scout out possibilities. The year after that, in 1683, is when a flood of Scots-Irish from that area came 
to the eastern shores of Maryland, where George and Maudlin had already been. But in 1686, another ship sailed, and it sailed from the coast of Senegal. It sailed from the Gambia River. It sailed from a slave port. It was a death ship. It was a ship where more than 100 people died on that voyage, coming over the transatlantic passage. And on that ship was a young man named Sambo, and they named him Gam, for Gambia. And over time, it became known as Game. His name, Sambo, was a very common name on the eastern edge of Senegal. It's a Wolof name. It means second son. He's from right around this region, right here. This is where the uh, Mali and Senegal and Guinea meet. Fortune Game McGee was born in 1687. Fortune Game McGee is the first, we believe, the first ancestor in my own family line that was born on American soil in that year, 1687. She, according to the 1681 law that Lord Baltimore changed for Irish Nell, she should not have been enslaved or indentured. She should have been able to live her life free, as Maudlin should have been able to live her life free, with no consequence for this mixed-race union between Maudlin and Sambo. But she wasn't. Because in 1692 there was a change to the law. In 1692, the, the General Assembly of Maryland began to rise up against Lord Baltimore. He fell out of their favor. They also began to get scared because the population of people of African descent in the colony of Maryland began to rise because of technology. Because the technology of the, of the English um, trading company, the, the African trading company, which was owned by, the, by England, that they, they began to, to use boats that could go directly from Africa to the coast of, of America without stopping in the Caribbean. Therefore, they had a flood of people of African descent coming into the colony. And by this time, by about 1692, black folk began to outnumber the number of, um, of people of European descent. So what happens when you begin to have shifting demographics? You begin to have hardening racial caste, and you begin to have hardening racial laws. So in 1662, sorry, 92, they passed a law that said white or mixed race women who bore children to, um, in the context of marriage to African men, right, to people of African descent, they would be indentured for seven years. Their children would be indentured for 21 years. So it went from nothing because of Irish Nell to this. Now, if it was illegitimate, in other words, if they were not married, then they would be indentured um, for 31 years. Now, this is, this is happening. This law is passed after um, Fortune is born. Five years after Fortune is born. And yet, in 1705, Fortune finds herself hauled into court. You see, the slave status would be determined by the status of the mother. And so Fortune could not be enslaved because her mother was white. But she would be indentured because her father was black. And guess who managed all of it? The church. The church managed it all because at one point, um, the, the legislature, the General Assembly, looked up and realized, guess what? The planters were now forcing their indentured Irish and Ulster Scott women to marry enslaved black men and have children by them. They were forcing it. Why? Because it increased their bottom line. So the General Assembly said, uh, you know, we didn't really 
bet on that. So we're going to change this. I don't know if I really believe that, quite honestly, because they were the planter class. Hello, somebody. But they changed it so that they took the power out of the hands of the planter to decide who gets enslaved and who gets indentured. And now they took it and put it in the hands of the church. And throughout the rest of the colonial era, until the Revolutionary War, the church became the primary auctioning block of the colonies, starting with Maryland, but going into Virginia and North Carolina and South Carolina and the rest. The church. The church was responsible then for controlling and confining and crushing the image of God on earth. Now in 1705, Fortune stands in that courtroom and she's ordered to serve an English woman of the courtier class. A woman who was granted the land that is basically the entire southern part of Maryland, all of Somerset County and beyond. A woman named Mary Day. Fortune bears three children in the service of Mary Day and never is a man ever mentioned in any of the genealogies. And I started wondering, why is that? So I did a little DNA sleuthing. You know, you can go in and see if you match with surnames. And it turns up, day is in me. So it's very likely that fortune was raped by one of the male members of the day family. And her daughter, Sarah, was indentured to a family called the Fuchs family. F-O-O-K-S and F-O-W-K-E-S, right? So these, these are actually gentry. Like we're talking about a family, the Fuchs W family. They were um, with King Henry VIII. They were with William the Conqueror as he entered in to England in 16 and made England in, 16, in 1066. Like they were that level of... Uh, of gentry in, in England. So they were used to owning, they were used to having, they were used to consuming. And their surname is in me. It's likely that this legal setup that encouraged This legal setup that indentured women who had children while in indenturing service and indentured their children for 21 or 31 years encouraged the men in the family to rape those women in order to gain free labor for another 21 or 31 years. And that's what they did. Notice who never bears the lash. Notice who never pays consequence for rape or abuse. Notice who is never penalized for impregnating his white or mixed race servants or enslaved black women. Consider the intersections of race and gender today. Where do you see the fruit of these roots manifesting in society today? So there were multiple kinds of women that were in society in the colonial era. There were Puritan women and wealthy European colonial women and unmarried women and widows. There were colonial indentured servants and indigenous women and colonial enslaved women who were free and those who were, I'm sorry, enslaved women and those who were free. And each of these women, they had different ways of navigating the power structures that were, uh, that were there. But the legal rights of colonial women, generally speaking, um, they included women were basically, uh, th those legal rights were few. Men dominated the society, and women were subservient to the men in their families, such as their brothers, 
um, even their children and their fathers. Divorce was practically unknown um, in the colonial America. Um, it was essentially a, a divorce-free society. And colonial women did not have the right to vote. They did not have the right to hold or form a public office, a form of public office. Um, colonial women did not have the right to serve on juries. So do you see how they had no capacity to exercise agency? And one thing we know from the scripture, and we read it right here on the first page of the Bible, is this in Genesis 1, where it says, Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Dominion here really just means stewardship. It means the capacity to exercise agency in the world, to make choices that impact the world. But here we see, we see that the laws are being constructed so that only white men can exercise agency. And really, what the laws then are saying to society are, is, theologically, only white men are made in the image of God. And, therefore, only white men are human. That's what the laws are saying. So the legal rights of unmarried women, this is really interesting, right? And widows, free or mixed race, they actually had a lot more freedom. And this explains in some ways why Fortune and her family actually were able to do a lot. Um, Fortune's, um, uh, one of her daughters, Betty, she was able to own land in, um, the, on the eastern shore of Maryland by 1656. She owned her own land. And there's great stories about that, and I'll share that in a minute. So if you were not married and you were white or mixed race, you could make a will, you could buy or sell property, you could act as a guardian, you had the right to sue or be sued, and in fact, you had a lot of women suing, um, in, uh, unmarried women suing uh, in Maryland. A widow received a one-third interest in the personal property of her deceased husband, one half if there were no children. So you, you see, like, if you were single or you were widowed, you actually had a lot more, a lot more um, power. It's when you got married that women literally became non-beings, according to the law. The rights of married women um, were like this. When a colonial woman married, her legal identity virtually disappeared. The legal existence of the woman was suspended during the marriage. Any property or goods, including livestock and money, left to a married woman in a will also was owned by the husband. A husband owned whatever belonged to his wife, except for personal items such as clothes or jewelry. Children legally belonged to their fathers. Married women had fewer rights than unmarried women or widows. Married women, for example, could not make a will without the explicit consent of her husband. She could not buy property. She could not make a contract. She could not sue or be sued in court. So we're going to fast forward now to Linnaeus. Actually, it's not a fast forward. It's around the same era. In that era, around 1767 now, we're still in the colonial era, on the tail end of the colonial era, Linnaeus, the botanist, begins to pontificate about this, the, the racial hierarchy, right? So we see it. We have seen it now um, established in philosophy. We now, then it went to religion with uh, Pope Nicholas V. Then it was uh, ruled into legislative law. And now it's now in science. Carl Linnaeus, I'm going to see if I can figure out what this rattling is. Sorry, guys. All right. So Carl Linnaeus um, is a botanist. He's the guy who discovered kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, right? So that was seventh grade science. Mr. Williams, he was really great. I'm so thankful, right? I still remember that. So 
he discovered that, and he thought to himself, oh, if it works with fauna, certainly it works with humanity. Let's try it. So that's when he established the hierarchy of human belonging that we now understand in terms of color and in terms of, in terms of location. So he put it this way. He called the ones on top, he said, are like me, right? Him, him, he, him speaking. Um, the ones like me are going to be on top, and we're going to call that white Europeanus. Very scientific, right? Yeah. Um, right underneath them is going to be red Americanus, okay? And I, it's ironic that that's the case because actually, of course, Native American people were among the most subjugated, and actually at this time, absolute genocide was happening against them. But in Europe, they were being fetishized. And so I believe that's why he put them second. And then underneath red Americanus became, was yellow Asiaticus, Okay, so again, very scientific. And, of course, on the bottom um, was black Africanus. It didn't take long. It took 20 years to go from that to three-fifths compromise. Constitutional law. The very first Congress and Constitutional Convention where the North and the South colluded in a compromise. One thing I learned um, when I, in, my, in the research for my book, Fortune, was that whenever there's been a compromise, we are the ones who are compromised. Remember that. It is the, the practice. It's the constant practice. It's even happening right now. Wherever there's a compromise between, let's say, liberals and conservatives, north and south. The ones who are compromised are us. The image of God in us is compromised. Remember that. So a three-fifths compromise was a legislative, like a, a, a basically the first gerrymander in American history, where because white people were so outnumbered by people of African descent in the South, um, they really would not have had very much representation in Congress, you know, in terms of ratio and, you know, quota. So the compromise was to say, okay, we're going to, we, the North did not want to count people of African descent at all. The South wanted to count every single one of them toward every single one of their enslaved human beings toward the, le the congressional representation. The compromise was to say three-fifths of every black person will be counted toward representation um, for Southern congressional members. But of course, that was only for the men. The women counted even less. Three years later, in 1790, you get the very first census and that first census only has, let me see if I can do this. Is this a pointer? Oh, no. What did I do? Okay, so it's not a pointer. <laughs> I'm afraid to use this. Is there a pointer on this? Uh, I don't know. Okay, never mind. So squint and you can see it. There's only one race that is actually on the very first census. And that very first census, the race was white. So understand that. Whenever I hear people of European descent say, well, we don't really have a race. We don't really have culture and ethnicity. No, actually, race was constructed around you. And that, that race, white, since 1790, the very first census, is the only racial construction that has never changed. So you will never see Irish as a race. You will never see Norwegian as a race. All of that was melded into whiteness. Why? To aggregate power. Meanwhile, you know, as you go on, the races get disaggregated and everybody else. And now you literally have about 50 different races that can be declared on the census. And uh, among them, Hmong. I mean, come on, that is not a race. That's a nationality. Hmong, okay? Or in a culture. But it's not a race. What does that do? It disaggregates power for everybody else, and it leaves people of European descent who, until they came to America, until they were declared white, 
we're not all one people group and actually warred against each other. So the, it's funny, Derek Bell, the grandfather of um, critical race theory, which some people would accuse me of being a propagator of, well, the reality is, is that critical race theory was a, it's a, it's a, it's a theory that was created in the 1970s and 80s, Derek Bell being among the first to imagine, to pontificate about this in the halls of, uh, of legal scholarship. And what he said was, you know, whiteness and blackness exists in order to aggregate power, in order to create peace on this land for people of European descent that had actually been warring against each other for millennia on the continent of Europe. So when you came here, you became white. And that whiteness gave you something in common with people who didn't even speak your language. And it also emulated the nobles and serfs class structure, but it was now racialized on American soil, that class structure of Europe. So the new nobles were the whites, and the serfs were everybody else. So you could be a serf in Europe and come to America and become a noble, just like that, because you now have the label white according to the law. So you have that, you have the first census, and then in the same year, 1790, you also have the very first Immigration Act. So remember how, remember how race, gender, and citizenship all come together in the same law and the very first racial law? Well, now here's another mile marker. The very first immigration law, 1790, declares the only people who can become naturalized citizens in America are white men of good character, which basically meant Christian. So again, race and gender are intersecting with citizenship in America. So Abigail Adams, I just love her. She, she did something really radical. Um, when her husband went to the, con the Constitutional Convention in 1776, and, or not the Constitutional Convention, but in the convention that actually declared independence. This is what she wrote to him. She wrote, oh, I gotta use these, sorry. She wrote, I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. How about that? 1776, okay? All right. So then, what do we know? We know that the Declaration of Independence was written, and this is what it said. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, unless you think they were thinking human, no, they were not. And here's how we know they were not. In 1777, women lost the right to vote in the state of New York. They gained the right right at, at the end of the Revolutionary War, or basically, you know, at, with that Declaration of Independence, and within one year, they lost it. Um, women lost the right to vote in Massachusetts. Again, they had passed the right to vote um, right after the Declaration of Independence, but then lost it a, a few years later. Women lost the right to vote in New Hampshire. The U.S. Constitutional Convention in 1787 places voting qualifications in the hands of the states, does that sound familiar? States' rights. Women in all states, except New Jersey, lose the right to vote. And then in 1790, the US state of New Jersey grants the vote to all free inhabitants, including black people and women. But then in 1807, Women lose the right to vote in New Jersey. And a black folk do too, by the way. The last state to revoke the right. So in Philadelphia, 
our grand city. Philadelphia, 1833, something amazing happens. In the 1790s, there was um, the Anti-Slavery Society was beginning to develop. Actually, it's a little bit in that, in that era. And it was right in that time, actually it was 1770s, and right in that time, um, they began to look to the women in around 1830s. In 1833, um, Lucretia Mott was uh, tapped on the shoulder and asked to form the female anti-slavery society, and she went to Margareta Fortin. Margareta Fortin was the daughter of James Fortin, who was one of the biggest financiers of the abolitionist movement and one of the richest people in Philadelphia proper, and he was black, and he had always been free, and he was a revolutionary hero. And so he, his, his, the women of his family basically got together along with a couple of other free black families, the women in those families, the Purvis family among them. And they helped form, along with Lucretia Mott, the, the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society. Um, it went, it was an operation from 1833 to 1870. They were active basically until the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments. So that first anti-slavery society... Um, they began to partner with other women across New York City and then up in Boston. And they held their very first convention in New York City in 1837. And there were very few black people there. But then the black women, hello, of Philadelphia said, we're going to hold our own um, uh, convention in Philadelphia. And so they raised the equivalent of a million dollars to purchase the Pennsylvania Hall. And the ribbon cutting was days before the 1838 con um, convention. And then as the convention um, forged ahead, threats against it grew. By Wednesday of that convention, a mob of white men started shouting and smashing windows. In addition, a number of African Americans were brutally assaulted as they exited the building. By Thursday, a raucous cloud of, a crowd of white men and boys surrounded Pennsylvania Hall. Alarmed, the building's managers asked Lucretia Mott to deliver a message, desiring the convention to recommend to their colored sisters not to attend the meeting to be held in the hall this evening because the mob seemed to direct their malice particularly toward the colored people. The evening session was called off. That night, the mob swelled to thousands see if I can get the cursor over here. It swelled to thousands. The police were in, ineffectual. Lavelle wrote, men broke into Pennsylvania Hall, opened the gas jets, and lit fires. When flames roared through the building, the mob blocked the fire trucks. The fiend-like cry. A scream went up as the roof fell in and Pennsylvania Hall was burned to the ground. The ladies carried on. They actually met at a nearby, um, a nearby school. And that was, this was the place, that was the place where the first in those two years, 37 and 38, where the first established um, women's empowerment conventions were happening in, in intersection with the questions of race in America and abolition. But then you flip about a decade later to the convention that is typically seen as the first Women's Empowerment Convention, the Seneca Falls Convention. And what do you notice about this picture? All white. And what do you notice about the narrative about this convention? That it's the first. So the work, the terror, the sweat, the danger that those free black women went through was erased 
by white women. Why? Because they were trying to placate white patriarchy in order to get what they needed out of white patriarchy. So the rise of the suffragist movement happened at the same time as the rise of the abolitionist movement. The critical question rose that turned the course of history. What time is it? What kairos is it? Is it time for suffrage or is it time for abolition? A lot of people said that if the suffragist movement were just to keep going, they could actually win suffrage. But everyone was discerning that it was actually time for abolition. So in a very fateful decision, the suffragist movement set aside its own goals and joined the abolitionist movement. And it's because of that that we were able eventually to win the war and win the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments. And the 15th Amendment gives the right to vote to black men, to all men who are citizens. Frederick Douglass told Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony to wait, to let black men move first. And there was a falling out in the movement because of that, because we were not, women were not taken along with men into the vote. So it took another 60 years. And that 60 years took several iterations. It included white women, like Alice Paul and Lucy Burns. It included black women, like Frances E. W. Harper of the National Colored Women's Association. Ida B. Wells, who marched in that very first March on Washington, which was the Women's March on Washington. And they, the white women in that Alice Paul and Lucy Burns had told the black women to march at the back, again, trying to compromise, trying to compromise with white patriarchy. But Ida B. Wells stepped to the front. She said, oh, hell no. <laughs> I'm not walking in the back. And she walked in the front, and there was a major riot that erupted. As a result, as the de facto minister of what is now the First Chinese Baptist Church of New York, between 1925 and 1966, Dr. Mabel Lee secured a relatively comfortable niche in turbulent times, and she began as a suffragist. You see, the witness of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in 1964 laid the foundations for passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. You see, the problem that we are struggling against at every single turn, every single part of our history, every single generation, every single movement is white patriarchy. Dolores Huerta and the Farm Workers Union was fighting against white patriarchy. The water protectors at Standing Rock were fighting against white patriarchy. The missing and murdered indigenous women up on the northern borders between America and Canada, in the Dakotas, in Minnesota, in Illinois, they are fighting against white patriarchy. These are our foundations, and we must face them. And we must consider their biblical implications. You see, just like we talked about earlier, the implication here is that what we have declared according to the law and practice and the way that we do life together is that the only full humans are white men because they are the only ones whose agency is always fully 
protected. But if we believed that all women were fully human and all humanity was fully human, then we, the citizens of a democracy, would demand that our laws protect the call, the divine call, and the divine capacity given to all humanity to exercise agency on the land to steward our nation. But we haven't. Instead, we have shaped our nation according to a lie. You see, I believe that we have in, in our own faith, we have the answer. It's baptism. Isn't that interesting? Elizabeth Key started this whole dealio when she said, I was baptized, therefore I cannot be enslaved according to your laws. Well, baptism, if we are all baptized, what we see once we are baptized, baptism is not only about declaring who is, in fact, it's not about declaring who is human and who is not. What baptism is meant to do according to the scripture, and we can see this in Galatians 3, 27, 28. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Now, let me ask you, what does he mean by that? Well, first, does he mean that there literally is no such thing now as a Jew or a Greek, a male or a female? No, that's not what he means. You can just look and see that's not the case. Does he mean now that only those in Jesus are the same? No. I believe what he means is that before you were baptized— you saw your fellow humans in the way that the empire has taught you to see them, through the lenses of human hierarchy, of belonging. But when you're baptized, when you go under the water and you come up, all that you see is the image of God in all. And what does that mean? It means that you see the call and the capacity of all to exercise stewardship of the world. When we gather together tomorrow, I will talk more about this directly from my book, fortune. And I welcome you. I welcome you to read the book, to go deeper into all of this, because the book traces 10 generations of my family story, starting with Maudlin and Sambo, and goes all the way up to myself and Inauguration Day 2021. So I want to say thank you Thank you for leaning in today, for allowing me to speak hard truths. And I welcome your questions now. Which one am I on? Great. On. Um, so when you ask questions, I'm going to ask you to use the microphone, even though I know y'all don't like doing that. Um, and I'll be on this side, and Frank will stay on this side. Um, I'm going to ask the first question, or sort of make a first comment, um, especially so, right, I read a little bit from David's um, sermon, and I actually stopped one sentence 
before I had planned to mm -hmm. because it made me uncomfortable what he said and something that you said I think um, maybe relates to the question I'm going to ask. Sure. So I didn't read this last sentence. So again, this is the language, not language that we use today. Um, but um, he says at the end, most important of all, the Negro has begun to find that he has a voice and that he is a person in his own right yes. and that he will be heard. And so what made me uncomfortable is that I'm pretty confident people knew they were human beings in their own right. And so the actual thing that David should have said is that we are beginning to understand that they are people in their own right. Yes and no. Okay, so, to, so give me your thoughts on that. <laughs> yes and no. I'd say yes in that from the very beginning, from the Maryland, you know, southern shores and Virginia in the 1600s, there have always been rebellions. There have always been uprisings. There have always been, and through the antebellum era, there have always been people of African descent saying no. There was Nat Turner. There were others. There was the Stono Rebellion. There was the Cato Rebellion in South Carolina. There were thousands, actually, of rebellions that happened throughout the revolutionary era, or sorry, the colonial era and into the antebellum era. So that is indication that, yes, there has been an understanding, yes, but there was also an assent to the laws by many. And in fact, it is the truth that at no point, at no point did more than 30% of black churches ever engage in the civil rights movement. 30%. So that's not to say that these people sitting in black pews did not know they were human. What it was is that they were they were, they had, they had resigned themselves that the power was too great on the other side and the cost was too great to push back. So they had resigned themselves to living in the world in a way that is subhuman. 55% of people of African descent in 1959 were living below the poverty line. One of the things we know about poverty is that it is violent. It does violence. And it's one of the quickest ways to crush the capacity of human beings to exercise agency over their own lives, their families, and in the world. So if it, what it means to be human is to be called and to be granted the capacity, even, even for the quadriplegic to have the capacity to exercise agency over their own breath. If what it means to be human is to exercise agency, then slavery and Jim Crow took that away from us. And we lived under those conditions for 246 years of slavery and another 90 years of Jim Crow. So yes, it messed with our psyche. I'll get into that actually tomorrow when we read from the chapter on Sharon, which is my mom, her chapter, where we talk about black power. Because that movement was a movement that, was, that rose from the grassroots, declaring we too are human beings. So they had to say it to themselves. There was a necessity to say it to ourselves. Thank you. Who has a question mm -hmm. or a comment or an appreciation? Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you question for you. Um, you, what I heard is a clear departure from kind of uh, the legal system and, uh, and the gospel at some point, right? Mm -hmm. um, at one point they were trying to, I guess, pair the two to some capacity, it seems, but then it was like, no, 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 it doesn't benefit us. And you touched on the church a little bit in its roles. Mm -hmm. In your research, have you heard, did you see anything 
where you learned what they were, what was being taught or said in churches, and how that was impacting society, and how does that inform us today? Mm. Oh, that's really good. So let me just go back, and we'll we'll fill in some of the blanks here, because right around that same time, first of all, you have to go back to Pope Nicholas, right? Pope Nicholas V. That was the church. Like the church had already declared that if you were not Christian, you were not fully human, and also if you're not civilized, you're not fully human, right? Or not human. So therefore you can be enslaved. So who is civilized? It's not like they gave like a PowerPoint presentation on who is civilized. They kind of just knew, right? It's people who were like them, people who build with stone, not wood. Even if the land didn't have stone, it had only wood. Um, it was people who dance through space, not in space, right? It was, it was people who had a written language that they could understand. That's what it meant to be civilized. And those were the people, in other words, people like them, who were fully human. That was the church that made that declaration. Now, were they making that declaration based on scripture? No. What it was was a horrible read of that very first page of the Bible when God says, and let them exercise dominion. And what the Pope, Nicholas V, read that as, as let all civilized people civilized are the ones who are called to exercise dominion. And then he had the right then to declare who was civilized. So that's what gets, that's that foundation. That's the foundation of the church. That's what everybody's standing on from that point forward are those foundations. So then it makes sense that the church, the church is really funny because the church, the church tries to establish um, the fact in the early co colonial era that baptized people cannot be enslaved, right? That's why Elizabeth Key won her freedom. But very soon after that, you see it in Virginia and you see it in Maryland, they actually declare, according to the law, baptism will make no difference whether or not you can be enslaved. Wow. Okay, so that goes direct, no matter how you read Galatians 3, um, 27, 28, it goes directly against the scripture. What is winning out there? Profit. That's what wins. When it comes, push comes to shove, the rubber meets the road, the members of the vestries who were also the members of, of, the, of the, the general assemblies and the house of Burgesses, the Bible didn't win, their faith didn't win, their profit margin won the argument. So that's the foundation. And then when, you, when, when, they, when they change the law, again, in Maryland, and they make the, the church is now the manager of the crushing of the image of God um, through enslavement and indenture, that lasts throughout. And then what happens, this really amazing um, thing happens right around, right, right around the time of the Revolution. And I think it's, it's in part inspired by the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution. You have the black church is established in protest to the white church, right? So that white Methodist church in Philadelphia that we all, we all know about, St. George's, I believe, right? So um, that white Methodist church would not allow the black folk to pray at the altar together. So James Fortin, um, uh, Absalom Jones, and Richard Allen, they staged a walkout, the three of them together, and said, we are going to have no part of this. Why? Because we believe the scripture. Because we believe, we, we know we are created in the image of God. We know that there is no slave or free in, um, when you are baptized. You see as, as God sees, no longer as empire teaches you to see. And so they established the very first African um, churches in America or denominations in America in response to that lie to the lie that was permeating the white church. So the black church itself is protest. Like the black church was established as protest. And throughout its history, from the very beginning through the civil rights movement, even now, black churches have been in many ways saving Christian faith bringing us back to the faith of those brown, colonized, indigenous people who wrote this text. 
So when you ask the question of, you know, what were the practices, how was the church thinking about it, the white church was thinking about it in terms that were very, very, it was, it was very um, diverse. There was, there was a whole spectrum of thought in terms of the white church, especially after the Revolutionary War. Like, that's where you get, you get the break, really, between Jonathan Edwards and Jonathan Edwards, Jr., Jonathan Edwards, of course, the, the catalyst of the First Great Awakening, or one of the great preachers of the, of the great First Great Awakening, he owned slaves. He owned slaves. His son preached against slavery at, a, at, a, at an abolitionist movement meeting in 1791. Jonathan Edwards, Jr., Right? So you see there's a break happening within the white church right around that same time. And it's led, it's catalyzed by the black church. So what happens right after that is the, is the, um, the second great awakening. And the second great awakening has at its forefront Charles Finney. And Charles Finney establishes the altar call to do two things. Because he says, as a nation... We are dirty. And they really, truly do believe that Jesus is coming again soon because stuff is going crazy, kind of like it's going right now. And he said, really, truly, right? And he said, we got to get clean because Jesus is coming again, and we are dirty because of the institution of slavery. So on the altar or next to it, depending on who you talk to, he had sign-up sheets for the abolitionist movement. The very first altar calls were also to sign people up for the abolitionist movement because he said it is impossible for you to be subject to the dominion of God and yet crush the image of God on earth. And of course, every denomination in that period, every denomination in America split because of the issue of slavery. There's, there's like three. <laughs> uh, one of the uh, slides you had had the uh, counterfeit, counterfeit Christianity. Could you tell me or tell us more about that? Because I couldn't quite get the context. Let's see if I can find it. Let's go back and you, you show me what I, which one it is. This one? Oh, yes. A crusade against slavery, counter counterfeit Christianity. So what they're saying is this is actually part of that abolitionist movement. It's one of the, one of the big, um, uh, it's part of the messaging of the abolitionist movement that went out. They were saying, look, every denomination is splitting over this issue of slavery. We need to come against counterfeit Christianity, the Christianity that chooses slavery and not abolition. That's counterfeit. It's not the Christianity of brown Jesus. It's not the Christianity of serially enslaved Jesus' people. It's not the Christianity of, of the colonized. What about, what, what this, is, this is right, okay, so let's see. This is, yeah, it's right around the time of Finney. So this is before the Civil War? Yes. Then, yeah. Yes. Early, before the war. Yeah, like 1840s, 18, 1840s, 1850s in that time. Thanks. There was another question here, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> She's been waiting for a long time. <laughs> My, mine is only a, a comment, and this is such a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. But um, what struck me uh, is your, your repetition of compromise. Yeah. And right now, we, we have so much terrible division in our nation, and we keep saying we need to compromise. We have to find a way to compromise because we're not acting. And yet what you're saying is compromise hurts who? And who wins in compromise? Money wins in compromise. White people win in compromise. Black people are hurt. Red people are, you know, so um, right. that, that really struck me today. So 
that's just a comment. Thank you so much. I'm glad you caught that. We are the ones who are the image of God is compromised on earth. When we compromise the full freedom, the capacity to flourish of every image of God, whether that image of God is held within a brown body, a red body, a yellow body, a white body, a female body, an LGBTQIA plus body. When the image of God is compromised, it is war against God. It is war. It is a waging of war against the kingdom, the reign of God. That's actually something else that we didn't mention today, but it's something I talk about in relationship to my last book a lot, The, the Very Good Gospel, is that the ancients, when they would have understood the image of the king, the image of the king, and they would have understood this, the readers of Genesis 1, the image of the king is a marker of where that king rules. And the health, what is that? The health of, those, of that image is a marker of the health of the kingdom. If you have flourishing images of the king everywhere, you know, you know entering the city and on the coins and, and everywhere, then it was understood that that kingdom is flourishing. But where you have busted images of the king, fallen, toppled, melted down images of the king, it was an indicator of war against that kingdom happening. So I believe that when God, how God sees the crushing of the image of God is a war against the kingdom of God. And guess what? In a democracy, our choice of our legislators, the choices of our legislators, are the most potent instruments that we have to wage that war. They're also the most potent instruments we have to cause flourishing of the image of God on earth. Thank you for asking that, or for for raising that. I have a question about um, how it hurts us in the church to only focus on our own piety, our own faith, our own individual uh, reading of scripture, and then resist taking that farther to um, systems of education, justice. Would you speak a little bit about that? Yes, I will. Thank you very much. (laughs) Thank you for asking that question. That's a really really great question. You know, you see this, right? The crusade against slavery and counterfeit Christianity. I mean, here in the abolitionist movement, they actually understood, and not just not just in that period, but also Wilberforce in England, right? Going back to the 1700s and into the early 1800s, when this war was being this 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 struggle was being waged on English soil and British soil, there was an absolute understanding that our our understanding of God. If no one else has something to say about how the polis should be living together, it should be those who are following brown, colonized, indigenous Jesus, whose people were serially colonized, whose people were colonized at the time of the writing of all four Gospels and most of the Old Testament, The only times in the Old Testament where they were not colonized at the time were when you see David's, basically anything that David is writing, because he's King David, and then also Solomon, who was also a king. But they were kings in utter fear of being colonized because they were not kings of an empire. They were kings of a dinky little kingdom that kept getting sacked by empires. So our faith, our, our sacred text was written, every word of the sacred text was written by colonized people in the context of colonization or fear of it. That needs to change the way we read this text. And it hasn't. It hasn't in large part, I believe, 
because this text, which rose from brown colonized indigenous people, was co-opted by Western Empire, particularly Rome, in the age of Constantine. So Constantine, or Europe, when Constantine grabbed hold of this text, he then, oh my goodness, he then became the, the, the ultimate decider of what we believe, even the Nicene Creed. Our creeds, he had to sign off on them. What do you get? What do you get when you see, when you have the halls of empire are the ones who become the, the locus point of the determination of orthodoxy for a brown colonized text. You get the watering down of that text. You get the individualization of that text. A friend of mine um, who is uh, an activist in South Africa, black South African, she's the one who taught me to say, her name is Renee August, Reverend Renee August, who was mentored by um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. She taught me to, to ask the critical question, who does that read of the scripture benefit? Who does it benefit to individualize the gospel? I'll tell you who it benefits. I was in a meeting about 20 years ago, a little less than 20 years ago. Um, it was a, coming into the 2006, I believe, election. No, 2008 election season. So Barack Obama was, was running for office, and, um, and it was a meeting that was um, hosted at Yale University. And um, it was a meeting that was, that convened um, a lot of, like, leading um, church folk, basically people who are faith leaders nationally, internationally, I mean, in major, major organizations. So, you know, um, um, uh, um, Land, Richard Land was there for the Southern Baptist Convention, and um, Ralph Reed was there representing um, the Christian Coalition, and um, Jim Wallace was there for Sojourners, and 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 right. So, and, and Miroslav Fulf, who was one of the lecturers here, he was actually one of the conveners. And I will, and every, all of us, we, and I don't know why, I literally got invited. I think honestly to to add color to the room. I literally, because I was brand new. I had I was writing my first book, um, Evangelical Design Equal Republican or Democrat, and um, and I, but I knew Jim, and so he got me on the list, right? So, so I'm sitting there in this room, and I'm flabbergasted of the people who were sitting around this table. And, um, and every one of us got to ask any one of us one question. And so I, being the newbie on the block, when it came to me, I said, can I ask two people? <laughs> and so they, they let me. They let me ask two people one question. So I asked Richard Land and Ralph Reed, the same question. It was a question that I had been asking faith leaders across the country in preparation for the book, Evangelical Does Not Equal Republican or Democrat, right? So, so the, the question was this, how does your conception of the gospel influence the platforms that you will stand for in the political realm, in the political sphere? Remember who I'm asking, right? At the time, Richard Land was the leader of the, um, of the ERLC, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission for the um, Southern Baptists. That's basically their government arm. And Ralph Reed, the, 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 uh, the star of the Christian coalition. The Christian coalition. Now, my theory at the time was that if your understanding of the gospel is individual, as in it only is about me and God, like Jesus paying the penalty for my sin so that I get to go to heaven and be with God, then it will either, it will do one of two things. Either it will shape your understanding of or, or your, the, the platforms that you stand for in that it will basically move you toward only standing for things that have to do with personal piety, right, which is usually what you end up having with the family, the uh, focus on the family, and um, anti-LGBTQ stuff, and abortion, all that stuff, right? So personal piety, or 
it will have nothing to do with your politics at all. Like it just, it'll be literally a non sequitur. It won't have anything to do with it. So I asked them, and Richard Land said, um, well, you know, my, my understanding of the gospel, um, it, it absolutely fuels my work against abortion. This is, you know, it, it, it fuels that work against abortion, and he went into why. And then when I asked R Ralph Reed, I said, how does your understanding of the gospel fuel the platforms that you will stand for, Mr. Ralph Reed, who is the golden child of the Christian coalition? And he said, it doesn't. It doesn't. It has nothing to do with it. He said, because I became Christian after I got into politics. <laughs> I really, my jaw dropped. And several people, and in fact, um, Pastor Rich Nathan from Vineyard, largest vineyard church in Columbus, Ohio, or largest vineyard church in America at the time, based in Columbus, Ohio, he said, um, Ralph, did I hear you right? Did I hear you right? And he's, he repeated it so that we can get it straight. Yes, you heard me right. It has nothing to do with my politics. But if your concept, my theory was, your understanding of the gospel is that Jesus came to free the image of God and to reconcile all the relationships that were broken at the fall, the relationship between us and God, the relationship between men and women, the relationship between us and the rest of creation, the relationship between ethnic groups, between nations. Then, your conception of the gospel will power a liberative politics. Okay, I'm going to say, la oh, we have two more. Do we have, can we do two more questions? We'll do the one in the back, and then we'll do him, and then that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. It was wonderful. Um, I guess what I want to ask you is how do you... Uh, keep the faith and stay hopeful. Um, two things weigh on me particularly. I, I, you know, grown up in the church my whole life. I started out as a Methodist, now I'm a Presbyterian. But somehow or another I got uh, to a very conservative um, Christian school from like 7th to 12th grade. So home was a little bit of a different message than what I got daily and it sort of it was interesting, but anyway. <laughs> so for me, um, I, 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 I want so desperately to understand why evangelicals are taking the path that they're taking. Mm -hmm. It just, it disgusts me and it worries me and it, and it saddens me, having known those people and been in relationship with them for so long growing up. But now evangelicals become a dirty word to me. It's less like I don't, you know, Jesus' call to us was to go out and evangelize the world. And yet I don't ever want to be seen or named by that word anymore. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, I have a, a lot of respect for the Dr. Um, Dr. Reverend William Barber yeah. and the Poor People's Campaign. That's something that's very important to me. And one of the tenets that he tried to communicate to many of the political candidates the last go round um, was this whole military industrial complex thing and the money that's going there instead of should be, you know, caring for people in poverty and all, you know, solving all these other problems. Mm -hmm. And now we have the war in Ukraine. And once again, <laughs> the bad guys won. Like, who benefits from the war? Mm -hmm. The military-industrial complex. That's, right. That's true. You know, and it's just like it's just like we're back to square one. That's how I feel most days. Like, it's mm -hmm. like how do we, how do we remain hopeful, and how do we keep fighting mm -hmm. uh, the fight because everything's against us. You know, it seems more so than normal at this moment in time. So it's just it's how do you maintain your hope, and and what do you do every day to to believe that it, it can get better. Let me just say, I have those days too. Just a few days ago, I woke up and I was like, oh my gosh, like it's just too much. Nuclear war, really? Putin, like really? Like I'm still there, I'm still there. Like really? You're really even uttering those words? Um, And right now, literally this year, is maybe the best chance that we have as African Americans to get what we as a people group are the only people group 
that have been oppressed on American soil that have never received reparations for the oppression that we experienced. Every other people group has experienced some form of reparations or restitution. We never have. Why? Why is that okay? This year, we actually have a window where that could pass, except now. Billions, $33 billion was approved to go to Ukraine yesterday. So, and that's not to say that I, I believe we actually, that is to say, I do believe we need to, we need to be in support of Ukraine. It's a bully. They're committing genocide. But I did wake up depressed. I was like, why does this always happen? This is what sustains me. In the beginning, when God created the heaven and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. This first line of the entire Bible was written as poetry, epic poetry, in the context of colonization and enslavement. Whether you think that it was Moses who wrote it or the priests who were exiting the Babylonian exile, that's the context of the, re of the reading, of the writing. They are exiting. They're on their way out of enslavement. Moses' case was hundreds of years. In the case of the Babylonians, I mean, sorry, the Hebrews exiting Babylon, 70 years of enslavement. And guess what? If it was Babylon, which is what, where I've landed, then guess where the gods of the Babylonians lived? in the deep, in the waters. Guess what the Babylonians told the Hebrews about how the God, their gods see them, see the Hebrews. They told the Hebrews that their gods saw the Hebrews as having been created to be enslaved. Sound familiar? If it's poetry, and it is, then it's not about the words on the page. It's about meaning that is higher than the words on the page, that the words are trying to capture. So in my read of this, what you see, and you also translate it, that word, formless void, is like, well, that's, it's actually kind of obvious. It's a formless void, but it's, it's, it's vacuous. Think vacuous. The darkness covered the earth. It's not just darkness, as in it's nighttime. It's actually all the D words. Destruction, desolation, covered the earth. If you can imagine what it felt like um, as a Jew in Germany after Kristallnacht, right? After the formation of the ghettos, that's what this is like. From within the concentration camps, it felt like this will never end. This can never end. That's how horrible this was for the Hebrews who were enslaved by the Babylonians. And I think that this is what they're doing in this passage. They're describing what their lives have been like in a really subversive way through art. Darkness covered the face of the deep. And the deep, again, is where the gods of the Babylonians live while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. That wind, ruach, is a feminine word, by the way. Hello, somebody, right? So ruach in the feminine, feminine God, hello, swept over the deep. Now, I always thought of that as being like, shh, shh, but that is not actually what the word the image the word gives us. It's actually a word that means to brood, as a hen broods over her eggs, about to hatch something. It's about to hatch. Something is about to be hatched into the world. God, the Spirit of God, is brooding over 
in poetry, position matters over the deep, over the home of the gods of their oppressors, over the supreme God. It's not even just God. It's the supreme God is over the gods of the oppressors. God is over and brooding, about to hatch something new into the world, about to go to war with this power that has controlled and confined and crushed the image of God in the Hebrews. And what does God do to wage war? God says, let there be light. And the light cuts the darkness. It cuts it. It limits it. It's interesting that it doesn't obliterate it. It puts boundaries on it. And I think, honestly, it couldn't obliterate it because in order to obliterate it, it would have to obliterate the memory of the darkness, the reality of the past of the last 70 years that the Hebrews have gone through of being enslaved. It limits it. It it declares the last day that the darkness wins. And isn't it interesting that they are writing this on their way out? So that gives me hope. Because our God is the God who limits the darkness. Our God is the God who cuts the darkness. That's why I don't know your politics, nor do I really care, quite honestly, at least in this moment. I do care on, in November, but we'll get to that, <laughs> right? So, but I'm not trying to change you right now. I'm just going to tell you about me. On the day, on the night, around 3 a.m., when Tr- President Trump, you know, came to the podium and and declared that he had won after um, Hillary Clinton had abdicated and said, okay, you won. My whole body literally shook. I've never experienced anything like that. It was was palpable terror. I was terrified. And my whole body shook. But even then, I knew that while the darkness may come, and it did, it will be limited. It will not win. Because that's what our God does. Our God limits the darkness. So I think back. I think back to the, the times in history when people of faith were tempted to lose faith tempted to think this is all too much those days before the civil war imagine right those those days in the south when people of faith were being lynched by people of the church deacons lynching deacons they didn't think that could end nobody thought slavery could end but it did It did because God cuts the darkness. And God doesn't do it just by blinking God's eyes. God raises up people like you, people like you, people like you, people of faith who will walk in the way of God, in the face of the darkness, like Rosa Parks did when she sat on that bus and said no to the darkness. That's how the darkness is cut. So yeah, I have faith. I have hope. Because I have hope that there are those who are following God. And I have hope because my call is to call you forth. That's my vocation, is to call you forth for such a time as right now. Amen. So, so Lisa's going to um, be, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Lisa's going to be out in the atrium. Um, if you haven't purchased a book yet, Alicia has books. To, we're selling books um, cheap, too, so $10 for the book. 
Um, so our gift to you. So if you don't have your book yet, $10, Alicia has them, but then Lisa will be out there um, as well. So thank you again, and more tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks.